The darkest day in Grand Prix history. That's how Murray Walker described the aftermath of Formula One's potential most terrible weekend. After a weekend of cautious driving, everyone sensed something was wrong. Their prediction came true on lap seven. However, the events leading up to the crash may have been more tragic. On Friday, April 29, 1994, Ayrton Senna boarded a helicopter at 8.30 a.m. to head to the track for a day of practice and qualifying for the Imola race. The Williams team worked hard to fix the car's difficulties. Between Japan and Imola, they tested the car extensively at the Nagaro track in southwestern France to improve its performance. Senna doubted the promised changes would work. Despite a stronger engine, the Williams vehicle regularly lagged behind the Benetton. Senna and his partner Damon Hill had openly complained about the car's handling. The time differences between Senna and Hill showed that Senna was handling the car's issues well. Hill subsequently modestly admitted during practice that Senna had huge reservoirs of ability and could overcome chassis shortcomings. As 9.30 a.m. approached, Senna climbed into his car and drove 22 laps. His fastest time was 1 minute, 21.598 seconds, beating his teammates. Hill was pleased with the car's performance, while Senna believed the team was misguiding it. He discussed his worries with his engineer David Brown for a long time. The first qualifying session began at 1 p.m. and Senna soon topped the standings. Rubens Barrichello had a terrifying crash at the Variant Bassa chicane 15 minutes into the session. Barrichello's Jordan vehicle took off and hit the barriers. Barrichello was unconscious but survived with a broken nose and injured ribs thanks to the tyres. Despite not seeing the crash, Senna rushed to check on Barrichello. Senna returned to the track during qualifying after checking on Barrichello. Senna set a record lap of 1 minute and 21.55 seconds at 1.40 p.m. With steely determination, he admitted that such performances were emotionally draining. Racing drivers must deal with certain issues. Although they're not human, you experience it. You must face unpleasant things to enjoy good ones. Following a passion means leaving a lot behind. Senna maintained his routine the next day, developing confidence in the better car before the second qualifying session at 1 p.m. Damon Hill pushed the vehicle up the grid. At 1.18 p.m., Austrian Roland Ratzenberger died in a session accident. Senna saw the accident's aftermath on the monitors and knew it was bad. He raced to the accident site out of duty and compassion. Ratzenberger died after the medical staff tried to save him sending shockwaves across the paddock. Professor Sid Watkins comforted Senna, who was grieving at a fellow racer's death. Senna's mind was occupied by that occurrence as the day ended. He clearly had never been so close to death. Damon Hill's practice on that fateful Sunday morning was difficult, especially when he approached Ratzenberger's crash site. His recollections of that impact dragged him down. Since I was travelling at the same speed as him before he fell off, I could envision the force of the hit. Under normal circumstances, I wouldn't have thought twice because speeds approach 200 miles an hour, but it's not a circuit where you'd come close to the limit. No worries there. After Ratzenberger's accident, Hill, like all racers, had to accept that sometimes you're just a passenger trusting your car to keep you alive at lethal speeds. Senna again dominated warm-up winning by nine-tenths of a second. His unexpected yet significant talk with Alain Prost after the session was a reflection of their long-time rivalry. Senna stressed safety and the need to put aside differences. Prost enjoyed this unexpected connection. I was very surprised as normally he did not even say hello if I crossed his path. Gerhard Berger accompanied Senna to the driver's briefing at 11 a.m. Senna used the formation lap to solve a pace car safety issue he had been avoiding owing to personal issues with the race official John Cosworth. The briefing was solemn, reminiscing on the day before and remembering Ratzenberger with a minute of silence. Senna's demeanour changed as he reached the Williams garage before race time. Senna noted for his rigorous preparations, inspected the car before the race. Car start near 2 o'clock creating a stir. 
cars lined up on the grid for the tempo lap. Suddenly, yellow flags flew, signalling chaos. Damon Hill commented, they'll have to stop the race. I'm sure because there's debris on the circuit. A crash between Pedro Lamy's Lotus and JJ Leto's Benetton ruined the race start, raising anxiety. That day at the track, everyone knew this was bad. The safety car arrived at 2.03 p.m. to clear debris for a safe race. The race resumed with Senna leading, followed by Schumacher, Berger and Hill. Senna flew again despite a full vehicle and chilly tyres. Michael Schumacher struggled to match the race leader's speed. The experienced motorsport physician Sid Watkins worried about his quick fall behind. Watkins confided in conversation with Mario Andretti. There's going to be an effing awful accident any minute. At 2.17 p.m. on the seventh lap, Ayrton Senna lost control of his car approaching the dangerous Tamburello turn and crashed into the unprotected concrete wall at 190 miles per hour. Despite trying to brake, the incident showed him up to 130 miles per hour, causing havoc. The impact broke the front right wheel and nose cone, stopping the car and leaving Senna immobilized. The crash's force propelled the front right wheel into the cockpit, hitting Senna's helmet. Following his injury, Senna moved little, giving hope. Medical staff arrived after fire marshals working against time to save the racing legend. While driving his medical car to the crash site, Professor Sid Watkins had a strange feeling that it was Senna. Senna's injuries were terrible. His medics tried hard to stabilize him, but the chances were against him. After his car was lifted, Senna was quickly taken to Maggiore Hospital, where medics fought to save him. The world waited for a miracle, but even the faithful felt tested. The race resumed 37 anxious minutes after the incident at 2.55 p.m. Everything was focused on Senna as the drivers raced around the track. Five minutes later, Ayrton Senna's helicopter arrived at the Maggiore Hospital, where physicians took him into intensive care for a brain scan. His heart stopped again at 3.10 p.m. and the racing world braced. Lotus technicians were threatened when Mikel Alboreto's Minardi wheel flew off on lap 41. Alboreto, realizing the gravity of the situation, hurried to investigate the pit lane incident. Everyone was on edge after two horrific tragedies in the paddock. Professor Sid Watkins endured terrible hours as the race seemed forever. This was irrelevant while a driver was dying. When the race ended without incident at 4.20 p.m., relief was brief. Schumacher, Lorini and Hakkinen, in that order on the podium, had no idea of Senna's condition, but their emotions suggested peril. It later emerged that Senna had carried an Austrian flag in his car, intending to honor Ratzenberger after the race. Medical updates worsened during the day. By night, the Imola Medical Center was filled with fear. Knowing Senna would never race again, the world held its breath, fearing the worse. The anticipated disaster was confirmed by the news. Ayrton Senna died at 2.17 p.m., and the world felt worse. After Senna's 1994 Imola crash, a thorough inquiry ensued. Italian investigators blamed Senna's steering column malfunction on a Williams tweak. Williams strongly denied fault, saying the steering column snapped after the incident. Damon Hill, Senna's teammate, gave another theory. He thought Senna made a rare mistake owing to excessive aggression while trying to beat Michael Schumacher. Hill noted Senna's uneasiness and anxiousness before the race, and Schumacher, who was tailing Senna at the time of the crash, did too. Driver explanations made Senna's death much more painful. He was devastated by the weekend happenings. No matter his abilities, he shouldn't have raced. In Brazil, Senna's death took the nation. More than three million people gathered in Sao Paulo to honor Senna as his casket was brought from the airport to the cemetery. Politicians, celebrities, drivers and national television viewers attended his funeral. Many public events were postponed or cancelled during three days of national mourning. Senna's death sparked worldwide tributes. Many racetrack named portions or sections after him and races were dedicated to him. 
But the subsequent Monaco Grand Prix, retired F1 world champion Niki Lauda announced the revival of the Grand Prix Drivers Association, GPDA, standing as a tribute to Senna's legacy. Immediate safety changes were instituted for the Spanish and Canadian Grand Prix, with a subsequent wave of enhancements encompassing redesigned tracks, improved crash barriers, tyre barriers, heightened safety standards, increased sills on driver cockpits and a limit on 3-litre engines. Senna should not have died, and yet he was gone in the blink of an eye. The rest of the season unfolded with a downbeat atmosphere, with Schumacher winning his first world championship. And yet, it was Imola that had changed F1 forever.